Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here with us today for the third and final Student Research and Innovation Showcase, hosted as part of WISIS's 2021 Spark Symposium Virtual Series. I'm Jennifer Souter, WISIS's Director of Patents and Licensing. For those of you not familiar with WISIS, we are a nonprofit supporting organization of the UW system. At WISIS, we support research, we protect and market ideas, we inspire students, and we build culture, all with the goal of inspiring Wisconsin innovation. On behalf of WISIS, we are once again delighted to be able to feature UW System student researchers and innovators as part of this live broadcast. Today, you will be hearing from 10 student groups from a variety of academic disciplines and UW campuses. Today's presentations will be scored by a judging panel, and our present presenting students will have the opportunity to earn cash awards for their efforts. Speaking of judges, I would now like to take this opportunity to welcome our judging panel for today's event. I'd like to first welcome Dr. Francis Mann from UW Parkside. Franny, you are most welcome. Can you give a wave? <laughs> Wonderful. From WISIS, please welcome Adira Sankara, our Manager of Innovative Ventures. Adira? And last but not least, Dr. Mark Levenstein from UW Platteville. Mark, thank you for being here today. Today's first place winner will take home a cash prize of $1,000. Today's second place winner will take home a cash prize of $500. I'd now like to take this opportunity to thank our prize sponsors and longstanding partners at the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and Boyle Fredrickson. We are grateful for your ongoing support. In addition to today's top prizes, all students who took part in the three student showcases held as part of the SPARC series have been in contention for the Tim Higgins Innovation Award, which will be awarded to the overall presentation demonstrating the highest degree of commercial relevance. This special award will be announced as part of the award ceremony at the conclusion of today's event. We have some of our uh, nominees from the first two showcases joining us today. In just a few moments, each presenter will be introduced and queued to start their presentation. Before we get started, however, I have a few notes of housekeeping. To get the most out of your viewing experience, we encourage you to use speaker view and ask that you leave your audio and video turned off during the main presentations. During each presentation, we ask that you please submit questions into the chat log, and we will address those questions during the subsequent networking sessions with each group of presenters. Following each presentation, the judging panel will have the opportunity to ask one to two questions of each presenter. And following the first five student presentations, we'll be opening up the session for further Q&A with the audience with those presenters. At the conclusion of the second group of student presentations, we will follow the same format and allow further Q&A with those student presenters as well. And finally, we will have closing remarks followed by the award ceremony. Now, without further ado, I am delighted to introduce our first group of presenters. Please join me in welcoming our first student presenter, Sherry Branham from UW-Green Bay. Sherry, you're most welcome. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Sherry Branham and I am a UW-GB graduate with my bachelor's in social work. Today, I will be discussing the concerns of pregnant women being incarcerated as a revocation and being denied an ATR or alternative to revocation. My passion stems from having personally experienced this since I am a recovering addict and a previously incarcerated individual. Next slide. The problem statement I analyzed was there's not enough research done on this population. With this lack of research, I concluded there is not enough treatment for women who are pregnant and facing a revocation. A revocation is given when an individual does not commit a crime but goes back to prison for violating their probation. This can be relapse, inability to obtain employment, missing probation officers, or other crimeless events that can be due to lack of support and treatment upon their previous release. Research shows that Wisconsin has one of the highest incarceration rates in the US. Between 1980 and 2016, Wisconsin's prison population increased by 456%. The prison system is overpopulated and it's anticipated this will continue to increase throughout the years. Revocation makes up about 40% of our prison population and this incarceration costs taxpayers about $147.5 million a year. Women are being incarcerated at a much higher rate than men and the number of women giving birth has been steadily increasing. Next slide.
My research was a comprehensive literature review to find data and studies that has been done in this population. The methodology I used was to search in the UWGB library database using keywords such as pregnant women, revocation, and family reunification. Next slide. The outcome was the relevant information I found through the literature review. It has been proven there is a lack of evidence-based treatment for incarcerated individuals, especially pregnant women. There is also data that indicated incarceration of parents has severe negative impacts for the children, as well as the mother. Lacking a bond with the mother can cause developmental, psychological, socio-emotional, and behavioral concerns in the children, which can result in future substance abuse in their own incarceration. Children are more likely to be put in foster care and parents are more likely to lose their parental rights without having any charges of child abuse or neglect. Incarcerated women are five times more likely than men to have children in foster care and lose their parental rights. 85% of incarcerated individuals struggle with substance abuse and there is multiple research that shows that women in this category are likely to have experienced trauma. When women are abusing substances, they are more likely to become pregnant due to the lack of protection and medical care. Often women find themselves pregnant while already abusing substances, putting them and their child at risk. Withdrawal can kill the baby while in utero and can cause complications for the mother. There are few empirical studies and a lack of quantitative research on this population. Also, there are no federal, state, or local agencies responsible for obtaining information about children separated from their mothers due to incarceration. In Wisconsin, there is one treatment facility where women can go for an ATR, be pregnant, and have their child after birth. This means 12 beds for the entire state. There are a few facilities where women can go while pregnant, but they then must be separated from their child after giving birth. These treatments are also made for all women with substance use disorder in Wisconsin, not specifically a revocation, so there is likely to be a wait period. This is possibility the lack of treatment is due to the stigma against this population. Next slide. My future research design will be a mixed method study, which will provide surveys to women who were incarcerated while pregnant and are now on probation. My plans would be to fill out form DOC 1198 to distribute my survey through probation and parole. I did not propose an IRB through UWGB since this is considered a vulnerable population and will need DOC approval. This research will assess if there is a correlation between pregnant women being incarcerated for a revocation as opposed to receiving treatment or an ATR. It will also examine if the individuals were offered treatment, the wait time on receiving treatment, and if the mother was separated from their child. Demographics and informed consent will also be included. I will also request non-public data in my proposal to identify how many women have already been incarcerated for a revocation. My hypothesis for this study would be that pregnant women would often be denied treatment when they received a revocation due to the lack of availability. My goal is to propose opening another ATR for pregnant women that uses evidence-based practice to provide substance abuse treatment, trauma-informed care, parenting education, and encourages mother-child bonding. This proposal will be contingent on if my research can validate there is a need. I will be collaborating with organizations who are supporting criminal justice reform. I have seen from personal experience, there is a lack of treatment for this population since I was incarcerated for a crimeless revocation for being on medical assisted treatment and no treatment was available for pregnant women. My doctor advocated for me to be released and continue medical assisted treatment since I was doing well from a healthcare perspective and a judge even ordered I be released to go to treatment. I still had to wait four months uh, to, in prison to go to treatment. I was finally able to go home to my first child when she was seven months and have been with her for almost seven years. My child was the motivating factor in my recovery, yet many women are not given this chance due to incarceration and losing custody of their child. Now my passion is to prove there is a need and provide this resource in the future to give mothers and children a chance at building that bond 
in decreasing intergenerational incarceration and our current prison population. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Are there any questions from the judges? Please feel free to turn your video and audio on. Um, Sherry, this is uh, Mark Levinstein. I'll ask a question of you. I, I'm, I'm wondering about um, the scope of need. You described a program that had 12 beds available throughout the state. If um, your proposal were to be, say, funded in full, what are your estimates about the number of beds that would satisfy the need? Just from what I've seen, um, and I know my research will have to validate this, but there is a need. Um, I mean, there's women that are incarcerated with a charge and then, you know, that's a little tricky, but the revocation is a problem with pregnant women. It's just a revocation problem in our whole state. Uh, it's 40% of the prison population. So I, I'm anticipating that there is definitely gonna be more than 12 beds and there's a need for more than 12 beds. Thanks. Adira? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Sherry, first off, thank you for bringing attention to such an important topic and for sharing your personal story with us with such grace. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for that. I guess my question is, what do you see as sort of the biggest obstacles to having a, a, a facility like this? Why is there only one? Do you have a sense of that? Um, I think there's just, first of all, the stigma um, and that just with the lack of research that's done on this population, um, the lack, there's nobody even monitoring this population. It just makes me think that that is why there's a lack of this resource. Um, I guess that's why I just really want to do this research and I plan to and hope to be able to provide more resources because there is a need. Thank you. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much, Sherry. Appreciate your presentation. All right. Next up, I'd like to welcome Sophia Canarella from UW Lacrosse. Sophia? Hi, um, my name is Sophia. Canarella and I am an undergraduate student at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Um, I will be presenting my work on purifying a Staphylococcus aureus lethal factor protein. Next slide. S. aureus is the leading cause of human skin infections, causing about 700,000 infections per year in the United States. Some different types of Staph aureus skin infections include scalded skin syndrome, furuncles or boils, cellulitis, and impetigo. Antibiotic resistant strains of Staph aureus are on the rise, making treatment more difficult. Almost two thirds of S. aureus strains are resistant to methicillin, and there is an also, there's also an increase in multi-resistant strains. New drugs with novel mechanisms of action are needed to treat Staph aureus infections in the United States. A drug developed at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse and the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee named SK0392 has been shown to kill S. aureus cells within 20 minutes. The structure of this drug is shown below. However, the mechanism of, the, of action for the drug has not been elucidated. Next slide. Our hypothesis is that the SK0392 drug causes the release of a lethal death factor protein within Staph aureus that kills other Staph aureus cells. To confirm our hypothesis, we went through the following scheme. We treated S aureus cells with eight micrograms per milliliter of the SK0392 drug for three hours. Below is a picture of what the supernatant looks like after three hours. As you can see, the untreated supernatant is very turbid, while the treated supernatant is not, giving us an idea of how fast the drug kills the S. aureus cells. Then we poured the culture through a 0.2 micrometer filter to get rid of any remaining bacteria. We then ran the supernatant through two stages of filtration. First, through an Amicon 10,000 Dalton filter, 
then through a micro content thousand Dalton filter to concentrate any proteins greater than 10,000 Daltons that have been released into the SK0392 drug treated cell supernatant. After running the supernatant through a micro content thousand Dalton filter, we wash the filter with buffer to remove any proteins that may be stuck to the filter. To determine if the lethal factor is a protein, we ran a kill assay in which we add fresh S. aureus cells to the filtered supernatant for 24 hours, and then compare colony forming units per milliliter between the untreated supernatant and the drug treated supernatant. We also boiled the supernatant to denature any protein left in the supernatant. And our final test to determine if the lethal factor is a protein was treating the supernatant with proteinase K to degrade any protein in the supernatant. Then to determine what the protein is, we ran a sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel or SDS page gel on the supernatant. This separates the proteins based on their size and each protein will appear as a band. Then we can cut out those bands and do mass spectrometry to be able to identify the structure of the protein. Next slide. According to our results, the lethal death factor may be a small protein. On the left is a graph of the kill assay results comparing the drug-treated three-hour supernatant, the untreated three-hour supernatant, and the treated three-hour supernatant that was filtered through the 10,000 Dalton filters. As you can see, there is about a fourfold difference between the untreated and the treated supernatant, and a significant 22-fold difference between the untreated supernatant and the treated filtered supernatant, indica indicating that there is a protein that is killing the S. aureus cells in the supernatant. To verify that the lethal factor is a protein, we conducted two experiments. In the middle of the slide is a graph of one of the experiments, boiling the three-hour supernatant. As you can see, there is a large increase in growth in comparing the treated three-hour supernatant with the treated supernatant that was boiled, indicating that denaturing protein within the supernatant reinstated S. aureus growth. On the left is a picture of the SDS page results, comparing the treated filtered supernatant with a molecular weight standard. You can see a prominent band around 12.5 kilodaltons. This we believe is the lethal factor. Next slide. In conclusion, my results have been consistent with our hypothesis that the SK0392 drug causes the release of, the, of a lethal death factor protein within Staph aureus that kills other Staph aureus cells. We believe the size of the lethal protein to be around 12.5 kilodaltons. Moving forward, we would like to identify what exactly the protein is. To do this, we can run mass spectrometry as well as N-terminal sequencing on the protein band cut out from the SDS page gel. Once the protein is identified, we will have confirmed a mechanism of action for the SK0392 drugs killing ability. Further, we will have uncovered a novel way to kill S. aureus cells. Next slide. And then I would like to acknowledge the WISIS slash UW Systems IGNITE grant, UWL Undergraduate Research and Creativity Research Grant, Dr. William Schwann, Dr. John May, Madison Moore, Kyle Gebhardt, and Allison Zink. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, any questions from the judges? I'll go ahead. Um, this is Franny Mann at UW Parkside. I am curious how you think this information will help uh, identify or be utilized to develop new antibiotics in the future. How do you think that'll work? Yeah, so um, SK0392 actually has a, is pretty effective against gram positive bacteria. So that's the bacteria have like multiple layers in their cell wall. And so po gram positive bacteria have a thicker like outer layer. Um, and so it's very effective in killing those drugs. Um, and also S. aureus has shown no um, resistance strains throughout whole project. So it hasn't become 
like resistant, like how there's like methicillin resistant and other antibiotic resistant um, strains of S. aureus. Interesting, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the judges? Uh, maybe I'll follow Franny's question with one a little more technical. If I'm interpreting your SDS page gel correctly, after your multiple rounds of, uh, of a 10,000 Dalton uh, filtration, you, um, was it surprising to see essentially just a single protein species left on uh, the gel? And kind of what were you, in, in, were you anticipating then? Yeah, it was a little bit surprising. Um, we had thought that it is only one protein before, um, but yeah, because we also, we use a protein, um, like a buffer that we grow the our culture in. So we thought maybe that some of those bands would come through too, but yeah, it was a little bit surprising, but we had anticipated that it was gonna be a single protein. Thanks, Sophia. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank you so much, Sophia. All right, next up, we have Ben Klaas from UW-Platteville. Ben? Hello, uh, I'm Ben Klaas from UW-Platteville. I'm majoring in mechanical engineering. Uh, today, I'll be talking a little bit about turbulence driven piezoelectric energy harvesting. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let's get into it. Um, next slide, please. So, there's three key concepts I'd like to give some important background on to start with. Uh, first of all, piezoelectricity um, materials which are piezoelectric uh, store energy in their um, electric fields uh, when placed underneath a mechanical load. Uh, so the relationship between the loading and the energy stored in that electrical field is given by that tensor equation there. Um, the mainstream application currently is for sensors. Uh, however, is currently being investigated for renewable energy uh, harvesting applications, in particular to power small devices that are in inaccessible locations where you, know, you can't change a battery. So for instance, uh, biomedical application for the power biomedical devices that are implanted in the human body. Um, switching gears a little bit, turbulence is a fluid mechanics uh, concept uh, defined as the chaotic or disorderly motion of a fluid. Uh, some of you may have experienced uh, turbulence uh, on an airplane ride. Uh, one of the ways we measure this is by a value called turbulence intensity, which is defined by that equation there. Lastly, uh, computational fluid dynamics, or as is abbreviated CFD. Um, in layman's terms, this is a computer simulation of a fluid flow. I'd be remiss if I didn't have the full technical definition there. Um, but in layman's terms, it is a computer simulation. Um, it is important to mention that at this point because that is primarily what we've used during uh, for this investigation. Next slide, please. So there's been a plethora of research on this topic already, uh, all by on different configurations. So a lot of it is attaching these piezoelectric harvesters to vibrating bodies, uh, such as machinery, in order to reclaim or recapture some of the energy that would just otherwise be lost due to sound or whatnot. Uh, then there's a subclass of research being done, um, these harvesters being excited by flow-induced vibrations. So that's just, um, vibrations caused by the movement of the surrounding fluid. Most of that research has been done on what's called vortex-induced vibrations, or VIV, where the vibration is caused by these passing vortices, um, as shown in the upper right figure. Um, however, in 2012, Hobeck and Inman uh, found that a cantilevered energy harvester in turbulent flow uh, actually had a higher electrical output um, than some of those uh, other configurations. Despite this, there's been relatively little research done on, on that kind of configuration. So that's the configuration we are investigating in this study. Um, in particular, we are looking to establish the relationship between turbulence and the electrical output. Uh, and our hypothesis is that the more turbulent the fluid, the higher the vibrations and the higher the electrical output. Next slide, please. 
uh, methods. As I mentioned, uh, we use CFD simulations for this uh, study. Uh, the original geometry or configuration was to have a turbulence inducing bluff body. That is just a structure upstream from the, uh, the harvester as shown in figure A to cause that turbulence, which would then cause that vibration. However, that makes it pretty hard to control our independent variable, which is turbulence intensity in this case. So we swap that out for what's called a synthetic turbulence generating inlet. So that is just telling the software to randomize the flow coming in through this face. Um, so we did multiple simulations uh, of this same geometry with a different turbulence intensity specified at the inlet for each simulation. The property or the value that we were monitoring was the motion of the piezoelectric harvester. In particular, we were monitoring the uh, position of the tip of that cantilevered harvester as our output signal. Uh, we, and that output signal will be correlated to electrical output. Next slide, please. In the, so results in the upper left, we see a chart, um, the tip displacement, the output signal root mean squared uh, as it relates to turbulence intensity. So we've noticed a uh, linear correlation uh, in the study and we expect to see that same trend uh, in physical tests with electrical output. The set of charts on the right shows the fast Fourier transforms uh, of the output signal. The orange dotted lines represent the fundamental or resonance frequency of the piezoelectric harvester. Uh, this is important to kind of track because in general, the vibration will be optimal when it's vibrating at this frequency. Uh, the lower left chart shows a power spectral density of the input force on the piezoelectric harvester. Uh, the purpose of that chart is just to show that the forces were acting at random frequencies. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, our hypothesis was confirmed. Uh, the vibration amplitude uh, increases turtles intensity became higher. Uh, we expect the relationship to hold true for electrical output as well uh, with the same linear trend. Uh, future work, we wanna investigate other independent variables, whether that be um, in inlet velocity, uh, the properties of the surrounding fluid or the properties of the piezoelectric harvester. Uh, we'd also like to alter simulation parameters. By that, I mean that historically, CFD simulations have shown to kind of vary the results based on a couple of setup parameters, which are not easily, easily attained. Um, so we wanna play around with those to make sure that these results do indeed reflect reality. Finally, we wanna compare uh, these results to results from physical experiments uh, for verification. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my fellow student, Nikhil Agarwal for working with me on this project as well as my two professors, Dr. Jorge Camacho and Dr. Eduardo Rabino for advising me. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Any questions from the judges? Uh, I have one for you. So you've mentioned early in your talk about how these types of harvesters are, are really useful for hard to access areas. Um, and I'm having trouble understanding how, uh, what, what type of area or location or environment would have a lot of turbulence and also be difficult to access. Do you have any idea for me? Yeah, so clearly the biomedical application I brought up uh, might not be applicable for the and the turbulence aspect. Um, however, automotive applications, um, the um, vibrating base was from a study on a compressor in an automobile, and that might be a place where you can fit something in there with turbulent flow. A couple other things I can think of would be like HVAC applications. Um, there's been researchers that, is, that have posited putting these like on seabeds. Um, or also I could think maybe powering devices if you, you can't attach a battery to them, like sensors um, that like would normally be powered by solar, but for whatever reason couldn't be powered by solar in that case. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the judges? Um, ben, on, on the other end, can you tell us what some of the maybe current common uses of piezoelectric devices are? 
So the main use is sensors. For the most part, sensing pressure. So if you've heard of um, the old light switch, the clapper, which will turn on and off your lights by clapping, the way that works is there's a sensor in there. It's a piezoelectric sensor that detects the pressure wave due to your clap. And that uh, resonates and that trips a higher electrical circuit, which will turn on and off your light. Uh, so most current applications with sensors are like that. Uh, as I mentioned, some current applications as far as energy harvesting goes, um, one I can think of is in New York City, I believe it's on Times Square, there's a turnstile where like there's like a plate that you step on and that generates enough electricity to power the turnstile. Um, researchers have posited putting them like underneath roads. So, you know, residual vibrations from your car going over it uh, to reclaim some energy there. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, it did, especially the clapper. I think I understand where it's going. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Well, thanks very much, Ben. All right, next up we have Julia Jones from UW Partside. Julia? Good afternoon. My name is Julia Jones and I'm a physics major at UW Parkside, presenting on our research on the growth of a high temperature superconductor-based thin film bilayer. This research is done in collaboration with University of Wisconsin-Madison and with the funding support under the WISIS Applied Research Grant from 2019 to 2021. In this presentation, I will describe the theories and application of a high temperature SIS tunneling Josephson junction device. Afterwards, I will describe our thin film growth of a heterostructure of 110 oriented YBCO and PBCGO and some data demonstrating the successful results of our new design and fabrication methods. Next slide. Before we go into the details of our work, let me first define a few things. Superconductors, unlike regular conductors, can, can carry a current indefinitely without losing energy. The temperature at which superconductivity occurs in a material is called the critical temperature, or TC, and normally this value is extremely low. Secondly, I would like to present a brief overview on Josephson junction devices, specifically the SIS or sandwich type, which is the design we are working on. An SIS Josephson junction is a nanoelectronic device where a current can flow in the absence of an electric voltage. It consists of two superconducting layers, sandwiching an extremely thin layer of an electrical insulator. These devices are found in squid biomagnetometer sensors for brain and heart imaging, as well as other equipment for fields such as quantum computing and NASA and space applications. So now you know the importance of Josephson junctions, but the question is, how can we improve them? Our high temperature superconductor YBCO-based Josephson junctions can operate with liquid nitrogen-based cryogenic systems instead of using liquid helium. This is estimated to cut total costs in half and the simple design is much more convenient to use. Additionally, high temperature superconductor-based Josephson junctions are more efficient than low TC superconductor-based devices. Here's the schematic diagram of our proposed SIS sandwich type design, where we can see the two YBCO layers sandwiching the nanometer thin PVC geo insulator layer. Next slide. Now I will move on to describe the growth and studies of a 110 oriented YBCO PBCGO heterostructure, which is the basic unit for making SIS Josephson junctions. Because the insulator layer must be less than 1.2 nanometers thin, we need a material with very high electrical resistivity. We developed an excellent oxide insulator 110 PBCGO by doping gallium in 110 PBCO with 20% copper substitution. PBCO has traditionally been used when attempting to fabricate Josephson junction devices but our DOPT version demonstrated an improved electrical resistivity of about five orders of magnitude higher than that of the PVCO thin film at 77 Kelvin. To grow the films, we first synthesized YBCO and PBCGO polycrystalline powders by solid state reaction method, and then fabricated discs using a high temperature electric furnace here at UW Parkside. We grew our heterostructure with this bulk material at UW-Madison using pulse laser-based deposition technique and the following growth parameters. The base vacuum has a pressure of 10 times, five times 10 to the negative seventh torr to ensure an ultra clean environment. And there was a background oxygen pressure of 200 torr. We used a KRF eczema laser 
to ablate the ceramic discs of YBCO and PVCGO and deposit the materials atom by atom onto a 110 LAO single crystal substrate for each layer of the device. Next slide. After fabrication of the heterostructure was complete, we, we performed the following characterization studies. The X-ray diffraction measurement showed 110 epitaxy, single phase, and good crystalline quality. The atomic force microscopy measurement showed no cracks and twin free surface morphology. The root mean squared roughness over a five by five micrometer area was two nanometers in our 166 nanometer bilayer of YBCO and PVCGO. Next slide. Our electrical resistivity measurement showed a TC value similar to the critical temperature of a single layer of YBCO. There was virtually no proximity effect as no significant degradation of the superconductivity of the heterostructure was observed. This graph shows the same onset TC values in multilayers containing constant thickness of YBCO and varied thickness of PVCGO. Next slide. As we near the end of our talk, let me provide you a brief summary and outlook of our research. Using the pulse laser-based deposition technique, we grew a heterostructure of YBCO and PBCGO with 110 epitaxy, excellent surface morphology, and without any proximity effect. The results of our various tests confirm we have optimized the growth process of this heterostructure. And our research has promising applications in system simplicity, higher efficiency, and low cost production of superconductor electronics that are already used in numerous fields. Moving forward from our high quality heterostructure, we are working on the nanofabrication of a high temperature YBCO based SIS Josephson junction device and measuring the tunneling current in this junction. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this talk, my research advisor, Home Kundel, and WISIS and the UW system for the funding to make this research possible. Thanks very much, Julia. Any questions from the judges? Um, I, I will, I will ask some questions for you, Julia. I think, um, you know, it's, it's a great job trying to um, give a, a highly technical presentation to, uh, you know, lay people outside of your field. So job well done there. And, and maybe my question is something about clarification. I'm assuming, and, and, and I apologize for missing this, that the, the Josephus junction, the, the, the junctions must be uh, assembled under low temperature. Is that correct? Um, it's more of when you are using them. So when, for example, in the squid biomagnetometer sensors, um, it's when they're using them in the hospital that um, in order for the Josephson junctions to work, they have to be cooled to a very low temperature because that's when superconductivity occurs. I see. So will then there be a requirement for devices to switch over to a nitrogen-based system to utilize your junctions, or will they be applicable in the current technology as well? Well, the, um, the systems that are used with the SIS junctions um, are normally liquid helium-based cryogenic systems. And these um, systems are very complex and expensive and um, hard to use. And so they would have to switch over to the um, liquid nitrogen based cryogenic systems. And I'm guessing that there might be um, some other equipment involved as well when um, you switch over to the high temperature based junctions. Okay, and then a, a quick follow up. I don't know if you can answer this, but uh, do, you, um, do you have a sense or do you know if there are partners interested in developing the system that, that's nitrogen based? Um, we are talking to a couple of companies right now in Wisconsin, actually. Um, unfortunately, I don't know them off the top of my head, but yes, when they do, um, when production of, if we get the uh, successful results from our tunneling current measurement, um, we're going to be finishing up some pat patents and hopefully filing them and then, uh, yeah, these, these companies, specifically Wisconsin-based companies, are um, very interested in these as they uh, are going to be a lot cheaper and easier to use, basically. 
Yeah, well, well, that's great. It's it's completely appropriate not to have to name those companies anyway, since you're so early in. I was just trying to get a sense. No, of that's okay. It's that a good was. question. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for the answer in the presentation. Yeah, of course. Any other questions from the judges? Yeah, I have a question. Um, and actually, Mark Mark stole my question. <laughs> I was going to ask you about if you're re reaching out to industry and what the interest looks like. But um, so these these one one zero oriented heterostructures that you've created. I mean, can you talk us through a little bit? And I know you touched on this. Can you elaborate on the reasoning behind? why you went down this pathway in the first place? Why was this the structure that you thought might work or were there other structures that you tried were, that weren't as successful? I guess what were the failed, uh, the failure rate of, of finding something that worked as well as this one did? Yeah, um, so with the 110 orientation, um, there's 110, there's C axis, there's in plane orientations and all of these, um, by nature have different characteristics. And so something about A-axis films is that there is a 90 degree um, rotation in the gr uh, grain boundary. And so we get the twin film structure, which is not what we're looking for. Um, the 110 and C-axis orientations, um, they do not have this occur. By nature, they have a macroscopic, uh, unique, same geometry throughout. Um, Additionally, we also adopt gallium in PBCO. And so other uh, failed attempts are with uh, junctions that use PBCO as the insulator. Um, and basically the electrical resistivity just isn't high enough. So with our um, gallium dopped PBCGO, we found that there was five orders of magnitude higher electrical resistivity, which is very exciting, as well as the, um, the uniform geometry and the smoothness of the film, which is what we're looking for to increase the ICRN product or efficiency of the device. Great, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Julia. All right, our final uh, presenter for this group is Sean McManus from UW Parkside. Sean? Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Sean McManus. I did my research under the guidance of Dr. Susan Lanky in the computer science department. Uh, we performed a risk analysis of the impacts of misinformation spread in, on online social networks and focused on election misinformation uh, to quantify the risk. We looked at federal costs in 2021 and the costs in Arizona as a representation for state level costs. Mike, could you hit the enter key, please? Move the slide. Thank you. So uh, in a risk analysis, you want to look at the assets that you need to protect, and our country's most precious assets are those that we are listed in the preamble of the Constitution. Uh, misinformation online has been studied as a phenomenon to look at why it happens and how to mitigate it. There has not been a risk analysis of the growing tide of misinformation. We evaluate the risk quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, the misinformation flood is putting our national assets at risk. In the last decade, the use of online social networks has increased dramatically. And so the reach of the online misinformation on these platforms has also increased. WhatsApp has over 2 billion active monthly users now, and in, uh, Instagram has exceeded 1 billion monthly active users. The Pew Research Center uh, does an annual survey of how Americans get their news. And in 2018, for the first time, uh, Americans reported getting it on online social networks above uh, print media. When people are surveyed and, and, and researchers look at why they share misinformation, it's most often because of social reasons. They do it because it's fun. Uh, it gives them a chance to engage with other people, start a conversation. And so those are difficult uh, motivations to mitigate. The uh, Communications Decency Act of 1996 shields online social networks from liability for what people post on the networks. And then the First Amendment protects citizens' free speech rights. So there's little, little inhibition there. Influencers are given guidance by the Federal Trade Commission if they are endorsing a product through the social media accounts. Uh, they must make a, an effort to explain a relationship to a product maker, so there's transparency for consumers. But politicians don't have similar guidance provided to them 
through the FTC or the Federal Elections Commission's the law, or even their own ethics guidelines. They don't have any guidance that says you must be truthful with your voters. Certified and Newsmax accepts the results. The political action committees and other campaign support organizations push the limits on their behalf. So there's no regulations to prevent it. So people in positions of influence and responsibility often abuse it. We don't want to relitigate the. Now, knowledge management can help using better framing and uh, to make research and scientific information more understandable and transparent will improve its acceptance. Researchers have found many ways with technology that you can identify the most impactful nodes on a network that are spreading the disinformation. Uh, there are techniques that you can use to inoculate consumers to recognize misinformation when they come across it. The challenge is we don't have a national coordinated program to try to make all this stuff uh, usable and to help mitigate the problem. And until we have a dedicated effort, we're going to continue to have this problem. We used open source data from news outlets, industry, and government, and we calculated nearly $1 billion in costs from the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. That included costs for the National Guard to protect the Capitol, and then supplemental spending to make repairs to infrastructure to help employees compensate police departments. And of course, there are many other uh, costs as well, as you can see. Misinformation has been used to justify new election laws in many states. The laws in Arizona are going to cost taxpayers over $13 million a year, and they're going to run the risk of impeding on people's voting rights. Uh, misinformation has been used to justify the audit in the Maricopa County, and one of the outcomes of that audit so far has been the decertification of the voting machines for which Maricopa County spent $6 million. Now they have to spend $3 million more un unbudgeted dollars to replace them. Uh, the folks that you see on the screen, they all have one thing in common. They were all put under threat by partisans who reacted to uh, misinformation that they received and were put, um, uh, in need, they all needed to have protection. And so uh, the Arizona Secretary of State was threatened and her family and herself needed to have state troopers protect her around the clock. Now, in our research, we couldn't find any specific reference to uh, an estimate of how much this cost, but if you you can find the pay scales for state troopers. And if you assume two troopers are working eight hour shifts, 24 hours a day, it's about $11,000 a week to support um, protection of someone like that. Uh, could you hit the enter key, please, uh, Mike? Now, if you think about each election cycle, there are you know six or so swing states in each cycle. Uh, and if four election officials are threatened and, and have to be put under protection in each state, and they get about eight weeks of protection, you're looking at about $2 million per election cycle in costs if, you, if there are similar costs to what we estimated for Arizona. That's an annual loss expectancy of about a million dollars a year. The, um, the misinformation is getting expensive and it's causing real costs to the taxpayers. Uh, we need a national program that's coordinated at the, the highest level to tackle these, this kind of a challenge. We've done these kind of big things before. Uh, we need leaders to lead on this before we have really irreparable harm done. There are tools uh, that are being built in many places, but they're uh, not all sort of synthesized into an effort to try to turn back the tide uh, that is really just flooding our news uh, spaces. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Thanks so much, Sean. Any questions from the judges? Sean, I am curious. You've made a really clear case for the costs of the actions of people who may have been influenced by misinformation. But I'm wondering, is there like a survey or some sort of data to help us understand how many of those people are directly influenced and reacting to misinformation as opposed to correct information any insight as to where they, their information uh, what implant what information directly influenced these people i don't think i have a reference that can point specifically to um statistical information that could answer that question thank you uh hi sean uh, thank you for your presentation you know, one of the things that you kind of mentioned was um, social media and how how misinformation sort of proliferates. And one of the things that we often hear about is how, uh, you know, you end up in these echo chambers in your social media where, you know, you, you're, you're, you're hearing information or misinformation that you're more likely to believe, right? Um, 
And a lot of these uh, social media networks kind of use very proprietary AI-based algorithms to figure out who's seeing what information. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you know some of the things that you talk about could be used to mitigate the risk of creating these AI-based um, algorithms? You know, they're, they're, you know, it's like recommendation engines, sort of like you see on Amazon, right? So you purchase something and you get recommendations for things that are similar that other people have purchased, right? It, it kind of works in, in a similar kind of way. And so the different platforms have their own proprietary ways of doing this, but they have similar effects as you described. Uh, now, they, these platforms have done and taken steps to try to uh, mitigate the impact of this by flagging um, misinformation when their AI identifies it. And they all have their own sort of approach in that regard to try to um, show people that what they're, they may be viewing might not be a, I'm going to say fact but that may not be exactly the fair way to say it, but uh, you know, may not be accurate information. Uh, but those, those are all different. They work in different ways uh, based on what the, the particular platform has decided to do. Uh, they have varying levels of uh, success. Um, there's a consumer reports evaluation of these uh, that was very interesting. They're, within the time that I had here, I didn't have time to kind of include some of that data, uh, but they, they, they've examined the way that the different platforms do this. Now, that doesn't address exactly your question. Your question was about the algorithms themselves that sort of build the echo chamber that, that make that space. You and know, how do you mitigate the risk from that? Yeah, uh, it, it could certainly be done because, you know, the effect that you're seeing uh, that we see um, that builds this sort of uh, uh, space where everybody's got a similar kind of point of view and excludes anything that's not alike. Uh, could just as well be, um, you know, programmed and logically uh, ex or improved. You know, you could you could work to make it like if you remember the fairness doctrine. Uh, if, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but if you remember back in, in you know uh, before the internet uh, in the late '80s, they ended this this requirement for news outlets to give both sides of a, of a topic. You know, there was a, if you're going to have a um, uh, a program where you're interviewing folks and you're going to take a point of view from one political spectrum, you had to have the opposing view there to kind of counter that, right? Kind of like um, CNN used to have a show like uh, Counterpoint or Crossfire, or something like that, right? And so they they ended that requirement uh, sometime around 1990-ish. And so that what you're suggesting is there should be something a little bit like that within the algorithm to sort of bring some of the other or, or expand the viewpoint that that's shown in the recommendations or in the in the news. Uh, information that gets fed to people through the platforms, correct? But now I don't, I don't have any information that, uh, that specifically des describes what the platforms are trying to do in that regard. But they have acknowledged that you know this is an issue that that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Great. So thanks so much, Sean. And I'd like to thank all of our group one presenters. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, we're, we're, we don't have a whole lot of time for questions from the audience, but I see one that's come in. Um, so I think this might be for Sean. Um, I'm currently doing research on social media influencers. Did you say something about the Federal Trade Commission recommending or requiring influencers to state who they are advertising for? So I don't know, Sean, if you have a very quick answer to yes. that question. There, there is an FTC guideline now. I'm going to describe it as a guideline. I, I can't necessarily say it's a rec, it's a regulation um, off the top of my head, but there is a guideline that uh, advises social media influencers that if you're going to be uh, promoting a product within your uh, space, that you need to make clear if you have a relationship. If it, is it your brother that owns the company? You know, do you own the company yourself, or are you being uh, paid in some way to do this? You know, if Kim Kardashian is drinking Coca-Cola on on her TV show you know, it should be made clear that Coca-Cola is paying her to do that, right? And so um, that that does exist, yes. And if you would like to, I could drop a link into the chat. Thank you so much. Um, and I think there was another question for Julia. Uh, could you share some practical applications for your usage? Julia? Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, so I just listed a, just a couple for the sake of time, uh, but I can go into it a little bit more. So like I was saying, it's those uh, squid biomagnetometer sensors. Uh, basically, the Josephson junctions can detect very small uh, magnetic um, frequencies. And so those are used in brain and heart imaging. We're also using the Joseph's injunctions for uh, qubits, rapid single flux quantum circuits, and terahertz frequency detectors. 
those uh, frequency detector detectors are used um, in airports too, like for airport security, that type of thing. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so I think we will go ahead and move on to the group two presentations just to keep on our time. Um, if you have other questions uh, for any presenter, please just do enter in the chat and I'll try my best to moderate them. So a big round of applause though for our first group of presenters. I think you all did a really fantastic job. Uh, so now I'm delighted to introduce our second group of presenters, and I'd like you to please join me in welcoming our next student presenter, Reed Oberg from UW Eau Claire. Reed? Hello, oh, am I on? Am I on? Oh, okay, all right. Um, so my name is Reed Oberg. Um, I am an undergraduate here at uh, UW Eau Claire. I'm currently studying physics and mathematics, and I'm working with Dr. Jewell and Kate O'Brien on the computational analysis of BI2212 filament structures using deep learning techniques. Uh, and this is funded by the US Department of Energy from the Office of High Energy Physics. physics. And uh, the award ID is right there if you want to take a look at that. Next slide, please. So. Uh, briefly, I want to discuss the, the fact that BI-2212 is a high field superconductor. And what that means is there was a, um, something from Julia. She mentioned superconductors earlier and described them. I'd like to redo that as well as a little here. Um, superconductors are materials that when you get them cold enough, what they begin to do is conduct current with little to no resistance at all. And what happens is when you can pump a lot of current through a material like that very quickly, you can generate these very large magnetic fields, um, vastly larger than what you'd normally um, encounter in most other circumstances. And it has many applications, a few to name would be like fusion reactors, um, medical imaging machines, or uh, in this case for high energy physics would be something like a collider, like the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider uh, in CERN, in Switzerland, uh, depicted up above there and things like that. And what we wanna focus on here with BI2212 is that it goes through this heat treatment uh, in order to create the wires for it. And on, during that heat treatment, the filaments themselves begin to agglomerate. So they like branch out and do the, the sort of a funky jig, as you can see at uh, the bottom image there. And some of them become just all branched together and meld, meld and do a bunch of other weird stuff. And the goal that we have here is to create a deep learning algorithm that can automatically identify all the cases of whether they are conjoined or isolated uh, filaments. And we do that uh, by using our deep learning, which uses a training data set and identifies patterns in our data. And then we apply it to general cases, which in this case means wires that it's never seen before. Next slide, please. So our methodology for doing this, so we start with creating a data set for the machine to use by, we take that, that wire image that you saw earlier or something like it, and we zoom in on one of those sub bundles and then we take a threshold of it. And that gets you the black and white image you can see on the left. And then what we do is we go in manually and color each of the filaments according to our specifications if we think they are conjoined enough or individual enough. And then we feed those into the model. Uh, specifically, it starts with the black and whites. It takes those, makes a prediction that's pretty much random at first checks how wrong it was based on the scorecard that we created, the, the colored image, and then it goes back, updates itself, and then makes a better prediction next time. And it just keeps doing this over and over again until eventually you get something that looks very similar to uh, the image on the right. And then we need to do uh, deep learning methods specifically because one, it's really hard to do by hand. It takes forever. Uh, it's not very accurate. Um, at, at large scale, at least. And the other thing is that traditional imaging analysis techniques, which have been well developed and are well known and understood, don't quite, uh, they aren't quite robust enough to be able to detect the filaments between the branching. We'll just detect all the filaments that are branching. And so you'd end up detecting like half the image. So we do need to use these deep learning techniques to get these predictions out there. Next slide, please. And our result of that you can see is that we start with the threshold on the left there. And then that's you know what we feed the model. And then in the center is the ground truth. It's what we, it's our scorecard that we made. And then that 
is not given to the model in this case on the next image here. It, it doesn't grade that. This is a standalone prediction. So what's on the far right is all the models doing on its own. And it's really cool. It's, uh, it's pretty close to uh, what it needs to be. It's uh, much better than the human eye in many cases. Um, and it's, it's really close to almost there. It's not perfect. You can see there's some artifacting going on here. <laughs> and uh, currently we're working to remove those, but it's, it's very close. And um, yeah, I think it's really cool. So uh, next slide, please. So some of the current challenges we're having is you know, that artifacting. And uh, also, as you can see in the image on the left, that's our prediction uh, from a different image. And then the ground truth associated on the right. And I've highlighted a little problem area there. You can see two things going on. One, it's the artifacting. And then two, you get just straight up misclassification. And this happens from two primary reasons. One, either it's got some form of contradiction in the data set, which essentially translates to human error. So we may have told it at some point that a lot of filaments that looked similar to that were individual. And so we give it the one that says that they're you know conjoined and then it misclassifies them. Or in the case of the half and half there, some with the artifacting, we believe that in the data set, there's about half and half breakdown of it being mentioned as individual and then being mentioned as conjoined. And it's essentially waffling in between there. And we're currently working on removing both of those by expanding data set um, and working on noise removal techniques after prediction to sort of shunt those filaments off into one category or the other. And then counting them. That's the other thing we wanted to do was uh, we want to get a count of how many individual and how many can join. And we're still working on that right now. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, so far we have uh, created a model that generates mostly accurate predictions. Uh, not perfect, but it's, it's really close. Uh, we're still working on narrowing down those edge cases, shunting off filaments to one category or another, and then counting them that sort of thing. And then our next steps that we wanna do are to increase the data set. And then that way, just more data always makes these deep learning models work better. And then we wanna fine tune some of our pre-training steps and some of our post prediction steps and get even better uh, results with that. Uh, I would like to thank you all for taking the time uh, to listen to this here today. I would like to thank Kate O'Brien and Dr. Jewell for being instrumental in allowing this research to happen. I'd like to thank all my coworkers here uh, at UW Eau Claire for being awesome sauce. So yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Reed. Any questions from the judges? Reed, I have a, a question and I guess my background uh, is, is not physics or even computational techniques, but I do occasionally use a program called uh, JMOL to quantify pixels when I'm looking at data to understand you know, how many of a red versus a blue or how many of a white versus a black. And I'm wondering if your, your method here is actually using some aspect of, of quantif quantification, because you've talked very generally about kind of correct or incorrect, but is there, are there numbers behind these? Yes, there are numbers behind these. Um, one of the things that there's a lot of metrics you can evaluate these by, We've decided to go with a straight up accuracy metric. So we just, we count all of the pixels and see how many of them match to the original ground truth that we created. And then from that, we can get a percentage of how accurately the thing is actually uh, predicting. And th those are the numbers we're using. And so as a follow-up for that, when you say mostly accurate, what's your threshold? Um, the threshold is whatever we can get to push up to the point where our post-processing can remove the noise outside of it and get it into a full prediction, which would be around 90, I'm going to say 92, 93%, somewhere in there. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Reed. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Michael Ryan from UW Lacrosse. Michael? Hi there, um, my name is Michael Ryan. Um, I am a senior at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, and I will be presenting the research that I worked on this summer of coincidence timing and Compton suppression techniques for nuclear structure studies. Next slide, please. So 
my research was conducted to support the lacrosse fireball project and in the bottom right corner there there's a little picture of the apparatus the objective of the fireball project is to learn more about the nucleus of an atom and in layman, layman's terms how we're doing this is we're shooting a bunch of energy at the nucleus and then detecting what energy how much where is emitted by said nucleus and that's kind of the middle picture right there um, is where we have gamma rays emitted, we have electrons emitted, and my specific research is focused on the detection of how many and the energy of the gamma rays emitted. Next slide, please. So one of the ways to improve gamma ray detection is to have accurate and quick detectors. And so I've got some pictures of detectors that I was experimenting with there. So we determine this by coincidence time and specifically measuring the amount of time the detector, the amount of time allowed for both the detectors to detect the same event, or in this case, a gamma ray, detecting the gamma ray at, within a specific window of time. So the various detectors I worked with were two barium fluoride detectors and one cerium bromide detector. Um, hooked them up to a voltage supply, their outputs were fed into a data acquisition system, and then a cesium-137 source was placed in between the detectors. Once the experiment was run, I was able to analyze data and determine the coincidence time by taking the full width to half maximum of the plotted data, which I have on the right side there. And so some of the results of testing my uh, scintillators were 5.41 nanoseconds for the large barium fluoride, 3.575 for the smaller barium fluoride, and 0 0.553 nanoseconds for the cerium bromide. Next slide, please. So Compton suppression. Compton suppression is reducing the Compton effect, or again, in layman's terms, reducing noise. Um, the Compton effect is when a gamma ray is interacting with a charged particle and decreases in energy. And since we want to know, all, we want all of the energy from that gamma ray, we need to suppress this effect. So we had to devise a way to determine which gamma rays were interacted and manipulated with and which were not. So how we actually accomplished this was surrounding the detection crystal of the high purity germanium detector or the HPGE there with a bismuth germanium oxide detector or BGO. The BGO will detect which gamma rays are deflected from the HPGE, allowing me to use some coding to filter them out as noise and actually increase the resolution of our gamma ray detection. Once again, this is accomplished by setting up a voltage source, output the data, outputting data to a data acquisition system. And I placed a 4.33 microcurie cesium source 0.7 meters away. And then the cobalt sources are actually on the surface of the crystal of the HPGE. Um, and so some of the results that we found by using a strong, weaker, and then no cobalt source um, from top to bottom, 0.548 microcurie, and then the 0 0.058 microcurie cobalt source. We found in both of those, there is a 60% reduction in noise, whereas with just the cesium source, there is a 10% reduction in noise. And this is in a logarithmic scale. So, you, so while the cesium source only had a 10% reduction, um, you can see that the actual background noise was in the counts of 10, whereas with our cobalt source, our noise was in the counts of hundreds and, and nearly thousands. Uh, I think it was about 600 um, for the strong and like uh, 100 for the weaker. Next slide, please. So my experiments had both good and bad <laughs> outcomes. Um, unfortunately, our barium fluoride detectors are not actually feasible for experimentation. And that is because the five point uh, something nanosecond time and the 3.575 nanosecond time are actually way over the industry standard of one nanosecond or sub one nanosecond um, co uh, coincidence timing. So this actually means that our cerium bromide detectors are great and ideal for timing experiments, detecting gamma rays um, while running the fireball experiment. And then um, lastly, 
it's actually really important that we had success in our Compton suppression um, because it, it, means, it means that by a reduction of noise, we are better at detecting gamma rays, which means that we can understand and learn more about the nucleus of said atom that we are trying to look at. Um, so I would like to take the rest of my time to acknowledge the University of Notre Dame, my lab partner, Peter Guerra, and graduate student, Kevin Lee, as well as professors Ani Abrahamian and Juan Peng Tan, um, my professor at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, Dr. Shelley Lesher, and the National Science Foundation grants um, for making this research opportunity possible and this presentation possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Any questions from the judges? Uh, Michael, this is uh, Mark Levenstein. Um, fascinating topic. Um, I wish I could be right there with you um, <laughs> in understanding all of it. Um, but can you give me an idea of um, you know, what type of applications uh, you might see, maybe um, medical, maybe industrial? Where does this type of technology lead? So this, this was actually where I struggled trying to figure that out, how to put it into my presentation, because it is a topic that to my understanding, no one's dove into that much. So it's, it's kind of in the, 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 the very, very early stages of understanding, understanding the nucleus of the atom and by understanding it more, what do we actually gain? That's something that, through all the professors that I've talked to hasn't been fully explained to me. It's one of those things where it could have the potential to do everything and nothing at the same time. And I, un unfortunately, there's just not a good answer for that. It is within nuclear structure studies though. And there's a lot of medical applications that um, other people were doing with projects surrounding um, everything else in the lab. So I am hopeful that it could develop you know, better techniques for, you know, creating, detecting isotopes and things like that. Um, but as for a specific application off the top of my head, I have no clue, unfortunately. Well, thanks for your honesty. And, and I could pepper you with a half hour of questions on this. I think it's pretty fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you. All right, next up, we have Brett Stack from UW-Whitewater. Brett? All righty. Hello, my name is Brett Stack, and this is my presentation for developing a prototype multimodal multi device for monitoring slope instability. And this was a multidisciplinary project between the geology, physics, and computer science department here at Whitewater. Uh, next slide, please. So our goals for the project were to create a device capable of sensing common triggers for landslides and such triggers include the initial ground moisture and rainfall, porosity and permeability of rock layers, temperature variations more specifically between the winter and spring seasons because that's when the freeze thaw cycle occurs within soils and then the rate of which this freezing and thawing occurs. And with all of this in mind we wanted to create a device that was both cost effective as well as, as, well as efficient and there are other devices out there that do monitor landslides. However, they're not as flexible as they could be when it comes to monitoring all the variables regarding landslides. Um, remote sensing is a great example of this. It's, it's awesome when it comes to large scale events, capturing large scale events. However, it's not as beneficial for smaller, more localized failures. Next slide, please. So for our research design, we used a Raspberry Pi 3B plus with a multi-sensor, multiplexer platform, which is awesome because it allows us to use multiple sensors with the Pi. It's relatively inexpensive and it doesn't use a whole lot of power, which is nice when it comes to deploying it in the field. And with that Pi, we have eight digital temperature sensor, sensors, which measure the temperature difference within rock layers. And we have been using liquid nitrogen to mimic the freezing conditions of lakeshore bluffs to create a temperature gradient. And then we also have four capacitive, capacitive moisture sensors, which me measure the capacitance of the water within the soil, as opposed to the moisture content, content itself. So when there is, and it comes out in voltages, the data. So when there's a low voltage reading, there's low capacitance, but a higher moisture content and then vice versa. 
And last but not least, we have our strain gauge sensor, also known as a load cell sensor, which allows us to monitor slow and rapid movement of land as tension is applied to the sensor. And we use this as an, as an alternative to extensometers, which are commonly used for the same purpose. However, those are, tend to be a bit more pricey, so the strain gauge just fits well with our, our whole cost effective nicely. Uh, next slide, please. So for calibration, the images on the bottom left here show how we implemented the sensors in our sandbox experiment. And then over to the top right is a graph of our, from our strain gauge sensor. And this data shows how data was recorded at different rates. So to do so, we apply, we tied a monofilament line from a sensor to a hand crank, and then we turn the crank at different rates to apply tension on the line. So the first spike shows the, line, the, the crank being turned slowly and then released at about three and a half kilograms. And then the second spike shows the crank being turned at a slightly quicker pace and actually the line becoming taut and then snapping at around the seven kilograms, hence the rapid drop off at the end as opposed to a sloping curve. And then down on the bottom right is a graph of our capacitive moisture sensors for two, two new sensors and two old sensors. And so although the voltages are, although the voltage readings are different for both sets of sensors, they do show a rapid decrease in voltage when the sand is fully saturated. However, we were expecting to see a gradual decline in slope as we added increments of water. And we're not too sure why these variations occurred, but that's something we're continuing to work to understand. Next slide, please. For field deployment, we've tested our prototype on campus as well as a farm field to see how it holds up under different, different weather patterns, make sure it doesn't overheat, see how, benefit, how efficient the battery power is, and to ensure quality data collection. And future work, future work for this project, we plan, we, we've, been, we've been talking with Port Washington and the LNRP, which is the Lakeshore Natural Research Partnership to discuss past and future ways to mitigate soil erosion and slope failure. And this is a great opportunity, a great way to open doors for community outreach and just an opportunity to deploy our sensors in this area. Next slide, please. And implications for the project, simply put, we wanted to develop possible safety precautions that can be taken regarding landslides, as this can help protect both human and animal, animal lives by preventing property damage of homes, business, businesses, and infrastructure. Unfortunately, these issues have enhanced as from the effects of climate change issue or such effects are from uh, rising lake levels and intense weather patterns, which then can cause higher wind and wave action, causing more undercutting and eventually um, slumps or landslides. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge and, and thank the Region Scholar Grant Whitewater's Research Apprenticeship Program and the Undergraduate Research Program for making this project possible. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brett. Any questions from the judges? I've got one for you, Brett. Um, yeah, you mentioned using liquid nitrogen to, uh, to, to cool your model. Is there a reason that you are using, um, I guess, such a, such a quick cooling reaction rather than cooling the whole system slowly? Um, part of it has to do with just the timing and how often we have to create these sandbox experiments. And we're trying to test different variables within, with layering, sand, different sand grain sizes. So there's some factors that the liquid nitrogen helps speed, speed the process up. Um, that's something we have discussed because obviously the soil doesn't freeze right away. But what we have been doing is we've, like, froze, we've put water in a tray, dumped the liquid nitrogen on top, and then we've we put that in between the layers of sand. So that's kind of helped replicate how the soil freezes beneath the ground. And like I said, it's not, uh, it's just pretty much to ensure that we can create uh, an experiment to see the slump occur and how it, how it transcends. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more quick one for you. Have you determined something like uh, a critical slope at which, um, you know, say landslide is um, imminent and um, like, have you been able to confirm that through prediction, I guess? 
So the angle of propose for sand is about 28 to 32 degrees. But when it gets wet, obviously, you can make steeper and steeper slopes. Um, we've been testing our experiment with anywhere between 45 to 70, um, 70 degrees. That's just, again, playing with the different variables, um, seeing how high we can stack it. Um, and it's and trying to replicate how the at least the area of study we're looking at now in Port Washington, the angle of that that slope. So we've been taking data from our field trips there. Um, we haven't really come. We really haven't had a set angle, I suppose. OK, thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Brett. All right. Next up, we have Cheyenne Wade from UW Eau Claire. Cheyenne. Hi, I'm Cheyenne Wade. I'm from the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. I work along with Dr. Jewell on the mechanical degradation of the niobium tin superconducting cables, along with Cameron Johnson and Jack Flens. Next slide. This first picture on the top uh, right is what a fusion reactor looks like in a fusion reaction, two atoms are combined and form a larger atom, along with releasing a small amount of energy. Uh, to create a successful fusion reactor, there must be a net positive energy. The International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, has been trying to do just that. ITER has built a fusion reactor called a tokamak that harnesses the elect the um, plasma electrical current with large magnetic coils in a ring shape. This can be seen in figure three. In order to create a large enough magnetic field, ITER must use superconducting materials, which can run an electric current with little to no resistance and generate a large magnetic field. ITER uses a niobium tin-based filament um, conductor that is seen in figure four. The geometry of the conductor is super important. It is extremely, an extremely bit brittle material and its superconductivity is tied to its strain. We are studying both the effect of electromagnetic and warm up cool down thermal cycling on Eater's niobium tin conductors. You can see in figure four that there's a force acting upon these wires. This is called the Lorentz force. During a final, final testing phase of their cable design, uh, Eater found that there was a significant loss of current due to some degradation. This was not seen in the prior tests. At the time, it was too late to fix their conductor design to prevent the degradations. So Eater needed to find out what happened during these tests and how to prevent it from happening again. The goal of this research is to use our image analysis techniques to better understand the impact of the electromagnetic and thermal cycling on the conductors. A secondary goal of this research is to identify a set of ideal operating conditions so that the degra degradation is minimalized. Advanced slide. Now we will look at the strand extraction part of our work. We are looking to see how electric, electromagnetic and thermal testing affects damage seen on the surface of wires and how this damage can affect the performance. So we take out the individual wires and they're examined for any dents on the surface using a confocal microscope. We measure the length, width, and depth of the dents. The result of these measurements is in figure five. Notice that the measurements are group, separated by group. The group one samples include cables that did not undergo testing or parts of tested cables that had a lower Lorentz force. Group two samples include cables that underwent testing but did not see the highest Lorentz force. And then the group three contains the samples that were tested at the highest Lorentz force. For both superconducting and copper wires, the dents present throughout the groups do not differ significantly in terms of width and depth. However, when looking at the lengths of the defects, an increase is seen when comparing the tested to the not tested samples. This result implies that the wires rub 
wires rub longitudinally against one another during the testing, which results in the dent lengthening rather than pinch, which would likely cause an increase in depth or width. Advanced slide. So we can look into why this rubbing is important. We also imaged the samples on the confocal microscope and looked at the transverse cross sections. We found that the Lorenz force was causing many of the wires to shift in the way of the force to the high pressure side. Because of this shift, there is more void space on the low pressure side of the cables. The local void fraction color map shows this void space nicely. This is a problem though, because as the tested samples get more space, they start to bend, which can be shown on the aspect ratio figure on the bottom right. This bending ultimately causes degradation of the cables. Now we wanna go, um, I'll have you advance the slide. Now we wanna go even deeper into the cables and see how the Lorentz force is affecting the filaments. We use nitric acid to make sure that the copper wires are not seen so we can focus on the superconducting cables. Uh, we can see in the upper right picture that the filaments are starting to break down in the low pressure zone with almost 80% of all damaged wires being from the low pressure zone. This is an interesting result because you might expect to see more damage on the high pressure side, but that is not the case. Uh, next slide. So just to reiterate, the conductors are subjected to the Lorentz force and the Lorentz force causes the wires to shift in the direction of that force, which increases the free space on the low pressure side and allows for filaments to bend, causing degradation of the cables. Some possible recommendations that we can make is to have a tighter cable twist. This would make it harder for the wires to separate and it would reduce the high local void fraction on the low pressure side. Or another solution could be to create more pedals that are smaller to stop the shift. I would just like to thank again, Dr. Jewell and everybody who's helped me in this research. Is there any questions? Thank you, Cheyenne. Any questions from the judges? Any questions from any of our judges? Mark, uh, you're muted. I'm not sure if you're trying to say something. I'm saying that she stumped me. Her presentation uh, is pretty clear through. All right. Well, thank you very much, Cheyenne. All right, next up, we have Anna Windorf from UW-Eau Claire. Anna? Hello everyone, my name is Anna Wendorf from UW Eau Claire, and I've had the wonderful opportunity to work on the Modernist Centennial Media Outreach Project. But before we begin, if you're wondering why I look like a chipmunk storing uh, nuts for the winter, I am recovering from dental surgery just a few days ago, but hopefully that won't impact um, our presentation here. So next slide. So you must be wondering, what is the Modernist Centennial Media Outreach Project and how did it begin? Well, there's a little story to that. So I was in my freshman year of college. It was about two weeks in and I was nobody. Um, I was just starting out as many people do. And my writing professor wrote on the board that he had two paid positions available to further his already existing research on modernism and his trip to the Western Front for the centennial of the Great War. And I thought, wow, that's out of left field. Um, and I was super interested in it. So then I signed on. And then my job throughout that project was to catalog photos like you see of the Sambwa Canal. And then from that, from those photos that also included, you know, explorations into modernism, 
which is generally described as the art movement or style around the turn of the 19th and 20th century, though this is debated. And we also explored, you know, writers around that time, such as Henry Barbusse, uh, Wilfred Owen, and Siegfried Sassoon. Next slide. And because of our work, we were actually able to, you know, expand that and present nationally and also locally. So in the spring of 2020, we did our first presentation on the landscapes of the Western Front uh, for the UWO Claire Symposium. And then our other presentation nationally just this past spring was on deep ecology and the writings of Owen and Barbuse. But there is a catch here. Um, the, as we know, the pandemic hit and then everything changed in our lives. So we found our research team, you know, not able to meet uh, and talk about what we would talk about, but we were still meeting. So then eventually, you know, we expanded our conversations beyond the 19th, turn of the 19th and 20th century to, to the whole of the 20th century and even some 21st century pieces. And that led to the creation of our podcast, The Pointless Century, which was launched in June, 2020. Next slide, please. So our conclusions of our work is that, you know, we don't really have one conclusion um, as often in the humanities because we believe in the complete and total exploration of this period of history. And like I said, modernism is loosely termed as the early 19th and 20th century art and style. And like I said, we continue to explore that era, but also the whole of the 20th century and even the 21st century and modernist pieces to you know, continue to explore the history within and around these pieces and see the patterns between them. You know, how did they affect our current and past history, our politics? and our society, you know, and the examples I've included here are our upcoming episodes on the famous poet and artist Mayakovsky, uh, French new wave films like The 400 Blows and an upcoming series on the Harlem Renaissance, like um, the Harlem Renaissance and poets like Claude McKay. Next slide. And the, I think the best part about this project is that you can actually support our work. Uh, you can listen, like, and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. And you can also listen to The Pointless Century itself on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcasts. And some fun other examples that I've included are, you know, conversations that we've already done. So Fantastic Mr. Fox, Conversations on Family. Uh, do the Right Thing, Conversations on Race and the Unrest of Last Year, and then Conversations on Birds of Prey and Feminisms and how they connect to the other three and beyond. Next slide, please. So I would like to take a minute to thank my mentor, professor, and friend, Dr. Frank Fuchile, and the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire Office and Research Office of Research and Sponsored Programs for their continued support of my and our work for almost two years. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anna. Any questions from the judges? Yeah, I, I'm wondering if you could provide maybe a concrete example or a specific example of how something that you learned about the 20th century is has changed your perspective or understanding of the modern world. Could you share like an anecdote or tidbit? Yeah, I think I, coming into this, you know, I didn't really have any background into World War I literature or World War I history and specifically military history. So learning about, you know, from the beginning, Owen's experiences in the war and also Siegfried Sassoon and other writers, you know, within that period has changed my perspective on what it takes to craft a poem in my own writing and what, what you know, the construction of writing, but also the construction of history. Um, before, you know, before 
working on this project, I thought of history as a continuous line. And now I think of it as more of a cycle or more fluid because of what I've learned from their experiences and also our conversations surrounding the 20th century. Thank you. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you so much, Anna. All right, so I'd like to give a big, big round of applause for our group two presenters. Uh, really great representation from all the campuses as well again. Uh, so at this time, we're gonna open up for further Q&A from the audience for our group two presenters. And I think there'll be some time as well if anyone has questions just for other presenters too from the first group. Um, I welcome everybody at this time to turn on your cameras, uh, switch to gallery mode. Um, you may also wish to, um, excuse me, switch to gallery mode. Uh, I mentioned submitting questions into the chat feature. Um, our regional associate, Brad Ricker, will be moderating the Q&A from here. So please also feel free to raise your hand um, or turn your audio and video on and ask directly and he'll help you through that. Um, we're going to take about 10 to 15 minutes to allow the judges to finish their deliberation and finalize the scores and reconvene here at 4.55 for a closing remarks and the award ceremony. So thanks very much. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks again, Anna, for your presentation and everyone else. So. Um, I think we understand we, we need to give the judges some time and space to figure out and sort out what's gone on. And uh, during that time, I, I'd love to hear questions uh, through the chat or if people want to raise their hand um, and, uh, you know, ask specific questions of any of the presenters. Um, and if not, I'm going to throw out general questions, not specifically on, on your specific research, uh, but in general about the experience of doing research that anyone in group one or group two, I hope you'll chime in with, with a response because um, I think some of the people who are on, online with us uh, as well as each other are interested to know What's a great way from your experience to connect with a research opportunity? We just heard from Anna that she went to one of her classes as a freshman and, you know, it was put on a plate for her, basically. Uh, at least, Anna, that's how it sounded. Um, and But other people, I think, probably have had to work harder to get a research opportunity. And I'm just curious if, if you can share some of your insights uh, with, with other people on how you did that or how you would do that in the future. Sorry, I had to rejoin with, could you repeat your question? I, I'm just asking what insights do people have for how to get connected with a research project like you've all worked on? And you told us, Anna, that you just showed up to class uh, and it was presented to you, basically. Uh, I suspect some other presenters had to work harder to get connected to their research. But, um, you know, let, let us know uh, your insights, either from experience or from how you would do it in the future. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can answer that question first, since I was uh, mentioned here. I think just any connection you can build with any professor um, is a great way to, you know, build that relationship and then ask them about their interests, right? Because so often, you know, you just see them as your professor, but asking for feedback and small things like that can really create and build that relationship. So then you can investigate their interests. And then if you like them enough, and if the relationship is mutual, then you can build that research partnership. Thank you. Somebody else? Uh, when I was interested in research, I just, um, I knew a couple of professors who did it at my university. I reached out to one in particular, and he was very uh, excited to have more students aboard because he has a couple different projects. Uh, so we set up a meeting and then kind of just went from there. It, it, was, it was very easy. 
Okay, somebody else. It's sounding easy so far. Yeah, um, there's yeah, there's like all the things you could do, like talk to your professors, um, show up to class. All those things help a lot. Um, but also, there's one other that that it's oddly helpful yet I think uh, can often be missed is just check your email. Like a lot of times, your professors really want to help you, and um, one of the main ways they do that is by like just spamming your inbox with random stuff. Uh, and some of them are opportunities. Other of them are just like, hey, stop and chat. You know, it, some of it's, you know, ads for um, bookstore stuff. But, you know, all your whole email stuff, all of it's really useful tool. And I think sometimes that goes missed. That That's what helped me get this position. So. Read your email or at least check your email. <laughs> Somebody else. Um, yeah, I agree with Anna. I think it's really important to build connections and put yourself out there. Like, don't be afraid to reach out to a professor. Um, a lot of them, almost all of them, I would say are really approachable and they'll work with you and help you with your whatever you want to do. So, yeah, building connections, I think, is very important. Great. Um, I would just say having that persistence and that passion for whatever you're researching, um, because I know having someone to help is important, but also sometimes it might just be you starting it and taking that first step is really important. So Sherry, I'm not going to pick on you, but I think you had some research ideas before you contacted faculty, correct? And, yeah. and so tell us about what that was like. You know, did you have to work hard to find somebody who was receptive to your ideas? Or when you came up with ideas, were they receptive immediately? Um, I would say a combination, I guess. Um, I've had professors that were always so supportive and receptive. Um, but I think there's also sometimes you hit those walls, um, depending on the topic you're researching. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Okay, I'm going to ask a related question, but a little, little different angle here. And that is, um, what does the research experience that you've had uh, cause you to want to do next or at some future point in your professional career. Um, you know, some of you told us in your presentations what the next thing that this was leading to is, but I'm also curious if some of you are just thinking, wow, I'd like to get a PhD and teach other people, or wow, I don't want to take another class in this subject. And I definitely don't want to teach other people uh, or, you know, whatever. I'm just curious uh, what this experience has led you to discover about your future interests and ambitions. And we have seven more minutes to use up. So go ahead, Julia. Um, I... I'm just thinking that this research experience really, you know, it gave me a good idea for just how much, um, just how much responsibility that I will be having in grad school as um, someone who will be doing research. And so my teacher has done like a really good job, um, you know, trying not to treat me as an undergraduate student almost and to be like, this is how it's going to be when you're in grad school. So Although sometimes it can be a little bit frightening, um, I definitely feel like I'm more prepared um, in that sense for once I do go to graduate school. And then also additionally, um, these kinds of presentations and stuff where we have to practice with um, our public speaking and also um, translating, you know, very scientific and technical ideas into more layman speech so other people can uh, realize the importance of your research. Um, it was just yesterday that my professor uh, mentioned like program management and stuff like that as a possible career choice where you're listening 
um, to the scientific ideas and then you're explaining to other people why you know it might be important to invest in these ideas and uh, even like grant mon uh, grant writing and that sort of thing so that's definitely something I've always thought I would be doing research um, in my future and so this kind of opened up a new perspective of other other things you can do with a background in science. Agreed, agreed, thank you. Uh, I, I think, um, well, for this, this the research experience here, um, I think it's professionally at least shown me that I really like working with computers. Like when they, they suck and they don't work all the time, right? And then that, then that they suddenly work and that's perfect, that's beautiful. It's, it's, oh, it's such a hoopla moment, I love it. Um, and I think I want to involve something, uh, at least something that's computational in my, uh, in whatever I do going forward with this, but also on a personal level, I've had like, uh, this, this interesting idea. I've wanted to like throw a stock trading robot in there, just, just see how it does, you know, at some point now that I'm actually building AIs and know how to build one, I, I might actually be able to like pull the trigger on that finally and just <laughs> see how it works. Give it like 50 bucks and watch a tank or soar or whatever. <laughs> well, you wouldn't be the first person to do that, but you might be one of the more successful people. So um, my advice would be give it a try. Um, and uh, I, I took a class in my MBA program where um, one of the fellow students, you know, just got totally distracted by trading futures and he made a lot of money. <laughs> okay, anybody else with uh, where this is leading you? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, just, just because I, I was working a little bit as, as an engineer and didn't really feel like I was was doing it, important work, next steps, you know, cutting level sorts of things. And that's actually where I stumbled into physics and specifically research physics in graduate school. And it's made me want to go get a PhD in either nuclear engineering or nuclear physics because it's it's all about being cutting edge. It's making the next newest thing. And like this, the, the project that I did, I, there's so much possibility for it and also zero at the same time. Like we're so far on the cutting edge that we have no idea what's going to happen with it. And it makes, it makes the tedious days seem so much less tedious because you're constantly working to change a foundation of something. And that's, that's what's really excited me. Great, thanks, Michael. Yeah, uh, being at the cutting edge is pretty exciting, regardless of what your field is. Um, and it's a little unnerving too, probably especially to spouses or other family <laughs> who might be depending on you for something. Uh, but anyway, um, someone else want to chime in on where this is leading them? Sean, you look like you're headed to the atmosphere. Maybe you're already up in outer space. I don't want you to see my messy office. I do work in industry already and um, I'm uh, you know, filling in some gaps in my education. So the class that I had uh, uh, taken on, uh, I'm working towards a cybersecurity certificate with Dr. Lenke. And this class was specifically designed for research. And so uh, you were asking earlier about how you, you find your way into that space. It was just a matter of uh, being part of the curriculum for this particular program. But um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I could see myself doing something similar or, or more of this in the future. Great, thank you. I see several of the judges. I think I see all the judges back. Is Jennifer going to lead this next section or is somebody else going to lead it? I think she needs a couple more minutes, Brad. Okay. Oh, great. Uh, we will keep chatting until you're uh, until you interrupt us. Um, so, well, um, I wasn't going to ask this question, but I I'm running out, so I'm going to. And that is, have you become aware of resources that are helpful for completing a research project? that you might not have been aware of before. 
Um, I mean, we all like to get a paycheck, right? So that's kind of an obvious one. But I'm thinking of broader resources, both equipment, materials, uh, you know, people who help you to make presentations, whatever. Um, what are some of the resources people become aware of that you know are, are useful in doing research, and that you know one needs to think about in the future? So for me, our presentation, our project was trying. Part of it was trying to create a device that's relatively cost effective, and so when we were when we were doing experiments and whatnot, we were trying to save money. So we would use pretty much anything we could find around the lab or we could bring from home to conduct these experiments. And then if, if need be, go out and buy whatever we need, but try to keep it uh, to a lower cost. So I guess budgeting was a big aspect in the pre within the project. And then, uh, yeah. Um, I think one of the resources that I've run into in, in my research was um, I didn't know that Eau Claire had a supercomputing cluster and let alone two. And now I'm using them. And it was like, like I've been here almost like two full years now. I had no idea it even existed until like four and a half months ago. <laughs> and now, and now it's, that's, that's been really, really helpful. So yeah, I don't know. It's, Great. That, that kind of falls in the category of checking out your email, right? Although you can always learn more, right? And that's what some of us try to do in our jobs. I think for me, it kind of just um, solidified something that I already knew, which is just about how many of the resources are already out there. And you really just have to find them and apply for the grants and that kind of stuff. Um, I know that there's definitely like thousands of dollars of scholarships that don't even get assigned like every year. So it's just kind of like um, reassuring myself that there's always going to be people out there with funds willing to help you. You just have to find them and make your pitch to them. And something else that I found was cool was on the WISIS website. Actually, when I was registering for this event, you guys have a grant um, writing like program or whatever or a workshop. And so I signed up for that because it just through this entire research experience, um, experience, like my professors always like constantly like writing grants and that kind of thing. So I was kind of avoiding it for a while, but I know that grant writing is definitely going to be of major importance in the field that I'm going to be going in. Can I ask a question, Brad? As I like to do. Um, and uh, Julie, you're right. Uh, grant writing, like it or not, you have to grant write. Um, you can't do anything without the funding. Um, superconducting seemed to be super popular in this um, in this uh, round here, and I was wondering for you guys, but others as well. Like when you heard superconducting talks, were you thinking to yourself, "Oh, this this ask this." project could layer into my own project or my project might be able to to um, connect into this one and not just within those superconducting but for the rest of you you guys as well were you thinking about how you know oh you know well I've got this you know my my project speaks to this other project or I'm hearing something relevant to my own work oh and Jennifer's back so you might not need to answer there's still time. Was there a pending question? <laughs> uh, please feel free. Huh? Well, everyone's probably very anxious. So, all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to get back to announce today's uh, winners of the Student Research and Innovation Showcase. Uh, first, really, a congratulations to everybody taking part today um, and the campuses that you're representing. A big thanks to all of our mentors out there today joining us. Um, you all did a really phenomenal job, and I just commend you for coming together and, and presenting your research, which is just really exciting to see. So another note on today's prizes, the first place winner will take home a cash prize 
prize of $1,000, and the second place winner will take home a cash prize of $500, courtesy of our prize sponsors at Wharf and Boyle Fredrickson. And in addition, as I mentioned earlier on, all students that have taken part through the series of the showcases have been competing for the Tim Higgins Innovation Award, um, which will be awarded to the project that demonstrated the highest potential for commercial relevance. And this special award will be announced following the first and second place awards uh, presentations today. So students, I'd ask you to please be prepared that if your name's called to please turn your video on, give a quick wave, and actually your video's on, so that's great, but if it's not, please turn it on to give a quick wave. And I'd also ask all award winners to stay afterwards so that we can take a quick screenshot with you all. So now, without further ado, to announce the first and second place winners of today's student showcase, on behalf of the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, I'd like to welcome Janan Yasserimo, Wharf's Director of Strategic Communication and Public Affairs. Janan, you're most welcome. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. This is so exciting. It's been marvelous uh, listening to everybody today. And I say congratulations to all because you're all winners in my heart. Our second place winner today is Ben Kloss of UW Platteville from Mechanical Engineering. Congratulations, Ben. And our first place winner is Julia Jones from UW Parkside from Physics. Congratulations, Julia and Ben. Well done. Thanks so much, Jadan. That's great, and well done, everybody. I'd now like to welcome WISIS President Arjun Sangha to introduce the Tim Higgins Award. Arjun? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, once again, uh, thanks to all the presenters. That's terrific. It was really great to, to hear your presentations and all the interesting work that's going around, on around the system. Um, thanks to our judges. Uh, I really appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to, to do that, and of course, uh, last but not least, our staff who just did a terrific job in putting on this and other events in our Spark Symposium. So thank you for that. Um, I see Tim's on the screen. Um, welcome, Tim. Uh, we're really lucky to have uh, somebody like Tim Higgins, uh, you know, that's associated with what we're doing. Uh, Tim is a former regent. He's a region emeritus for the University of Wisconsin system. And I believe he was the first chair of the Regents Ready Committee, Research, Economic Development, and Innovation Committee. And, uh, you know, as somebody, you know, who's extremely busy, uh, you know, and that position is a very big position, a real a hallmark of Tim was that we saw him everywhere around the state. I don't know how he did it um, or, you know, how he managed to show up, but, he really cares about all of the schools and all of the institutions and the and the work that's going on uh, all across the system and 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 how important higher education is to Wisconsin. And it was really uh, something for me to see that kind of dedication and support from the region. So thank you, Tim, for that. Tim was also a part of our WISIS advisory board and showed up for every meeting and was a, a regular contributor and you know always showed up for this symposium of course this time it's virtual but when it was in person he would be there as well so um and and of course uh, you know his is the first gift that weiss has ever received he's endowed this award uh which is just amazing and that just shows his dedication so thanks to tim and jana for um, for for being you know so generous in in recognizing the importance of this activity. So Tim, without further ado, could you announce uh, our Tim Higgins Award winner? I will certainly uh, do that, uh, Arjun. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm flattered and humbled to be able to announce the Tim Higgins Innovation Award winner today. Uh, but first, thanks to all the students who have participated in each of the showcases. Uh, the time and effort you've all put into your projects are a tribute to your commitment to expanding the world's body of knowledge. Uh, our world is a better place because of what you and the countless other students who have preceded you have done. It's also important to recognize the wonderful faculty members who have given freely of their time and expertise to mentor, encourage, and guide the students who have participated in these showcases. 
your contributions to the educational development of these students and of those you teach every day are exemplary. And finally, thanks to WISIS and its strategic partners, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, the Board of Regents of the UW System, and the individual universities who have made the effort to engage students and faculty in research that will lead to more economic development and jobs in Wisconsin communities. This is the incarnation of the famous Wisconsin idea. And now I'll announce that the Tim Higgins Innovation Award winner for 2021 is Leah Polis of UW Parkside. Congratulations and thanks Leah for all your work. Thanks so much, Tim. Well, that concludes today's events. On behalf of WISIS, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. We really hope you have, uh, enjoyed all of the presentations and enjoyed the networking Q&A sessions. And remember the conversations don't have to stop here. Um, if there's anything we can do to help facilitate further discussion, or if you'd like to be connected to any of our students or their mentors, um, please, please let us know. We'll be happy to do that. Um, but again, thanks everybody for joining us today and congratulations to all the students and the winners. Thanks again. Bye.